That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Burial, the second film directed by Ben Parker, which premiered at the Fright Fest Film Festival and IFC Midnight will be releasing it September 2nd, 2022. What's Ben's first film? A 2016 film called The Chamber, not to be confused with the John Grisham adaptation from the 90s starring Gene Hackman, Chris O'Donnell, and Faye Dunaway. Uh, More notably to us, because we've seen it, uh, he wrote the film 2019 film The Girl on the Third Floor directed by Travis Stevens which I believe we reviewed with that handsome guy the the UFC fighter mm-hmm. or, I remember that wow <clears throat> surprising I thought this was a horror film so I think that already I will, is playing against the film now I as will, I talk about it I will say it has a well cut trailer uh, which I usually don't watch trailers but I watch, you did so to convince you to see this film uh, and I, I was actually quite excited based on what was in that trailer yeah but this movie is not a horror film because if you watch the trailer there's like these there are these soldiers carrying like a box and they're burying it at night so we assume there's like some supernatural element because of how there are these other people dressed in like like animal fur you know like it it just had a very eerie feel to it but this movie turned out to be very different Mm -hmm. the basic story is 1945 there are some soviet soldiers who are transporting hitler's dead body Mm -hmm. and they're doing so to get it to stalin because he wants proof hitler's dead but on the way there are some german soldiers called werewolves Mm -hmm. those are the ones in the trailer wearing like animal skins Mm -hmm. Who are trying to intercept the body because they want to you know put out propaganda saying that that is not hitler's body mm-hmm. ultimately the werewolves do intercept the body and perform an autopsy perform an autopsy or record a video saying this is not hitler but then some of the soviet soldiers do get a hold of the body i'm gonna get to the the, the gag at the end but <clears throat> one of the soldiers decides that since they're not going to be able to get the body to Stalin, they would rather destroy it than let the Germans get it. So we see this one soldier take it, go like in the basement of this house, and then the house is on fire, so the body's destroyed. The end. But the film is framed around... The the film is basically completely a flashback. It's a flashback that is occurring in 1991. London. London. One of those Soviet soldiers, a woman, mm-hmm. whose name is... Uh, her real name is Brana, played by Charlotte Vega. But we meet her as a woman named Anna, living in London, played by Harriet Walter. She's at home, this old lady, and like a skinhead breaks into her house. Mm-hmm. But she gets the upper hand on his ass real quick and chains him to the radiator. And it becomes clear that he knows who she is. He knows that she is the soldier who was involved in transporting Hitler's body. But she has him incapacitated. So she decides that, oh, you think you know the truth? I'm going to tell you the truth. She drugs him with a paralytic, tells him the full story, the 80 minutes of the movie we watch. And then in the end, we go back to 1991. And she goes, oh, I forgot to mention one more thing. She goes into her armoire, pulls out a hat box, shows him what's in the box. We don't see it, but based on the story we were told and the look on his face, we can assume it's Hitler's head in that box. Mm -hmm. She lets him see it. She feeds him a beverage that also has some drugs in it to kill him. The end. It's also uh, implied that she knew this man was coming because the other survivor from this quest, uh, Lucas, played by Tom Felton, who's better known as Draco Malfoy from the Harriet Potter films, he, the skinhead is wearing a necklace that he Lu- wore. that Lucas had, and he'd been killed in a burglary break-in, so she kind of knew this was coming. And she, so we can assume that this skinhead was going to kill her. Mm-hmm. That's it. That is it. That is the story. I don't have any notes because I thought this was very basic. I think the first 30 minutes, the cinematography, the vibe... I mean, up until they, they do open the box and we see Hitler's dead body. Who's like hooked up to they, they, formaldehyde. They're trying to preserve it, so he's hooked up to formaldehyde. I thought the visuals, the mood, all that was very interesting. But once we realize there is no supernatural element, things kind of go off track and then... It kind of stagnates. Because, you know, the way it's being marketed. But then when daylight comes, 
The cinematography is very different. It has a very different vibe. It almost felt like maybe they ran out of steam and money to finish the movie, but it felt repetitive. It did Some feel- of the CGI, particularly like the fire that occurs in the house where Hitler's body is burned, I thought was subpar. Sure. Uh, I, I didn't so mind so much mind the difference between the night and day difference in cinematography. I, I think that was a stylistic choice. It was a uh, lens by Ryan Kotov, uh, an Estonian director of photography who lends Zaza Rushad's uh, Tangerines, which is a big deal about a decade ago from that country. But <clears throat> So this story is making a choice, right? It's saying that this is what happened to Hitler. Well, like Hitler it, killed himself in this bunker. Officially, Hitler and his... Uh, Ava Brown, his girlfriend, killed themselves, and per their instructions, they, after they were dead, taken uh, out and doused in petrol and burned. So this is taking some liberties, saying that that didn't happen, and Stalin is basically just this, you know, pro- like a problematic manager, has to see things with his own eyes, even though it makes no damn sense to make these people go through this. So I think if, if this is the story they want to tell, the least interesting part of the story is the actual transport. And we spent a lot of time with the transport. I wish the movie would have started with Hitler in the bunker. And we see him take his own life. Then the Soviet soldiers get a hold of the body. Then they get the instructions to transport it. And then that takes very little time before we get to the werewolves intercepting it. And then we spend more time on the like the, the, the propaganda they're working on to show that it's not Hitler. I feel like... Everything else about the story is more interesting than the story we got. Sure. It does start off promisingly enough because they have this, you know, coffin crate that they have to bury every night. And you do think there might, this film is kind of supernatural leaning. And we talk about the werewolves, which are basically older men and younger men that uh, were living out in the woods and still carrying out kind of the Nazi mission and, you know, the film ref- directly references Goebbels, uh, kind of trying to make it this mystical thing that there's these people out there. But really, they're just kind of like uh, the berserkers from North mythology, like dressed in in bear clothes and believing that they are one with the animal and acting like that. Uh, but but really, again, it's once all of that is revealed, it just becomes it it does stagnate. Yeah. What else you got? I, you know, find the end of the war period, reconstruction period, and uh, kind of how all these Nazis scattered, and we have Nazi, you know, plenty of Nazi hunter movies, and, uh, you know, Joseph Mengele got away. It, it, there are a lot, it's rife with possibilities, this kind of storytelling. And ba- What's the movie we watched in our last house on the patio about the Nazis, and it's like sci-fi? Mm, yes. That was much better than I That expected. was much better. I'm forgetting Overlord. Yeah. Uh, the preview, this preview made me uh, remember uh, a film I really liked from starring Christopher Lee. Uh, and if you can find a picture of what he looks like in that from 1963 called The Virgin of Nuremberg. He's basically this Holocaust survivor that's locking these girls up and experiment, experimenting on them in this castle, but he's horribly disfigured. I, I kind of had wanted some kind of vibe like that. And when it's clear that there aren't going to be any supernatural elements, I was hoping it would kind of become like Larissa Shapitko's uh, The Ascent, which is an excellent movie from the late 70s, uh, Soviet cinema. But it it doesn't do that. I, I feel like nobody has really got any kind of characterization in, in this. Even Anna slash Brana, um, Harriet Walter stars as the, the older version of this character that was supposed to be Diana Rigg, but she died right before uh, filming started. So we get Harriet Walter, who's a very busy actor. She's in three several successful series going on right now like Ted Lasso, Succession, and The Crown. Uh, I watched all of Ridley Scott's The Last Duel and thought she was Amanda Plummer. (laughs) But I kind of like her her vibe on screen. She is Amanda Plummer-esque. And as Charlotte Vega as the younger Brana, I I like that character. Again, it just really spins its wheels and we aren't going anywhere. Who's the gray-haired man? Uh, That is Barry Ward, who they call Thor, Tor. I thought he was handsome. He is handsome. Uh, I don't know that I felt like he was styled correctly. For the time? For the time. Like, his hair was distracting to me. Uh, But he was the lead in this Ken Loach film that I didn't like called Jimmy's Hall uh, back in 2014. But he's in all kinds of stuff. Yes, he does have some presence. But almost everybody else, I think, kind of falls to the wayside. Even the the rapist Soviet uh, Vadim. And, And Tom Felton, who I was expecting they would utilize correctly uh 
Again, some nice macabre details. We learn about what memento mori means uh, to the Romans, like remember death, like you've escaped death, uh, and, and this kind of remem remembrance of it, uh, which, you know, is what cinema is all about uh, as well, especially dealing with uh, World War II. But, yeah, I don't know. I, it just, it really didn't work. What would you give it? Uh, I would give two out of five. Yeah, I would give it two out of five. But, you know, like, check out the first, like, 40 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not a complete waste of time. It's just, it's not really doing anything. I, I think he, uh, Ben Parker, who also wrote the script, could have taken so many more liberties than he does. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.